Welcome to Crestview Missionary Baptist Church. We are here with people sitting in pews, and we are with you live on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers we have. Amen. All right, we're going to start with This Is My Father's World. Want to give input, and so if you want to 
text me some input on what you'd like to see changed or added or modified, whatever. We may even have a section for recipes on there. Who knows, you know? Um, but uh, we're going to be putting sermons on there. We even have a live stream feature where it has a countdown for live streaming of our service. So if you look at it early in the morning, you see you have three hours left until the service. It would be a great thing to even watch it on our website. And you can look around at our other things. We put prayer requests and all sorts of things on there. So uh, I'm getting a hint to move forward. So I'm going to do that. Uh, all right. Uh, the, the Byford's Backyard Bash. We're going to have that July 4th. So uh, and this is barbecue, and they're going to provide meat, and we provide all the fun and excitement uh, ourselves. And so I want to invite everyone to that. Uh, is that right, guys? Yes. Yes. All right. I want to make sure. And by the way, we're going to have a cornhole tournament, and we're going to have a homemade ice cream competition. We're going to have most original and best tasting, all that stuff. So don't get your feelings hurt if yours doesn't get paid. But we're going to have trophies and prizes. So that would be a great way to come back and be together. And so be a part of that. Father's Day today. How many of you guys are fathers? You guys are fathers out there? Right? All right. We want to give honor or honor is due. Proverbs uh, 17, verse 6 says, uh, Children's children are the crown of all men, and, and the glory of children are their fathers. So the glory of, that, that fathers have is in their, their children. And so what a blessing it is to have the opportunity and, uh, to be a father. I'm father of three boys, and I'm so proud of my boys. Even when I'm not proud of them, I love them. And, you, and that's one thing great about our fathers today. Um, and, and that's the blessing we have in coming to God's house. Because we get to point our children to a heavenly father. Amen. What a blessing that is. Our, uh, our thought here today is just this. After services, uh, the, the pastor and I, we, uh, Hayden, Hayden, you have things you're going to be passing out for our fathers as Father's Day gifts uh, in the back. And so we want you to really receive that and know that we really, we really love and really respect you as fathers today. Amen. Amen. And, and um, that's our last slide for this, but we're going to stand and have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing on the day ahead as we might give our honor and praise to our Heavenly Father. Dear God, we thank you and praise you for this day and for this time together, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of coming in, into your house to worship you and to put you on the throne room of our hearts and our minds and our strength, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we would see the love that you provide. And as we as we see you as our Father and our Heavenly Father, the one who loves us, Lord, we may not have earthly fathers that we can we can honor today, but we always have you that we can put on the, on the, that throne, Lord. We cry out to you, Abba, Father, which is to say, Daddy, and. We just look at you as our, our king, but mostly as our father, because we have a relationship as sons and daughters of you. If, we, if there's one here hearing this today that does not know you, the free pardon of sin, may this be the day that they can honor you as father, as trusting in your son for salvation. We thank you and praise you in your son's precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Okay, we're going to sing the hymn, The Love of God. It's number 59. <coughs> No, but we should have the words up here. The love of God is greater
now we're going to sing, You're a Good, Good Father. You know, there's a lot of stories about what the Lord is like. A lot of people look at God as a cosmic killjoy who just takes out people that are sinful and bad. Well, we'd all be taken out if that were the case. But our Heavenly Father just loves us and teaches us and takes us in in our times of weakness and our, our times of falling away. And that makes Him a good, good Father. If you don't know Him as Heavenly Father today, may you know Him. May, may you trust in Him. If you don't have a good Father role model to look forward to, and, and, to, and to honor this Father's Day. Today is the day you can trust in Him as your Heavenly Father.
good to see each one of you. Thank you guys for your uh, music today. We appreciate your leadership. And we're thankful that each one of you have come to be with us. If you're viewing on uh, our Facebook Live or our YouTube, this is the pastor of the Crestview Missionary Baptist Church, and we welcome you as viewers as well today. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers, and we appreciate you that have been able uh, to come and be with us this time. Realizing that there are fathers that are not here with us today, that they've gone on before us, I want us to stand and just have a moment of silence followed by a prayer uh, in honor and in memory of those who have gone. They're not forgotten. They are appreciated, and they are still loved. Father, we thank you today for being our Heavenly Father, that we can call you our Heavenly Father because of your Son, Jesus. And we pray, Father, today that you would receive thanks for those fathers that are present. And today, Lord, we honor the memory of those who have gone on before us. We thank you for their love and their commitment. We thank you for all the sacrifices that they made for us in childhood and we pray father today that they are enjoying the bliss of your house and father that uh, we look forward to the times when we will be reunited with them and with the lovely lord jesus thank you father for bringing us into this place and this convocation that we can assemble together and we can worship you and we pray this in jesus name and for his sake Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We direct your attention today to Genesis 1. Today we're going to talk about the love of a father. The love of a father. Can y'all hear me in the back? Okay. And so today we uh, look at the book of Genesis where it all began. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. The book of Revelation is a book of endings. Uh, it's on Saturdays at 5 o'clock. I am teaching through the book of Revelation, our Sunday school classes, and on Danny Chapel Facebook. And so if you want to tune in for that, I won't tell you it's the best exposition you have ever heard of Revelation. Uh, it's a feeble effort. And, uh, but uh, it's uh, enjoyable, very time consuming, preparing for that. And so I would uh, be honored if you would like to join us for that study. Genesis chapter one, beginning with verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. What is a father? I guess if we took a poll today, everyone would have some kind of a definition and maybe even explanation about what your concept of a father is. Uh, it's a position that God has given to those who have born children. It's a great honor uh, to uh, have that position. Um, years ago, I remember reading a, a story uh, about a, uh, a classroom of uh, students and a teacher asked them if they would uh, draw a picture of God. 
And these were just little kids. And they, uh, when she collected the, uh, the pictures, uh, she had all kinds of pictures. Uh, everything from a rainbow to a man with big, huge hands. And uh, one child had a picture of a man dressed in a suit. A suit, coat and tie, everything. And so uh, the teacher uh, asked her, she said, uh, what is this picture of this man in this suit? And she said, well, I don't know what God looks like, so I just drew a picture of my dad. <laughs> and so today many children look at their fathers and they are very uh, enamored by them and respect them greatly. Uh, Adam and Eve, we find here, uh, are created by God. Adam became the first father. Eve became the first mother. We celebrated Mother's Day just a few short weeks ago. We certainly uh, appreciate and honor them uh, as well. But today's Dad's special day. It's the Father's Day. And uh, these two, Adam and Eve, seem to make a, uh, a joined uh, representation of God. And that we are responsible to God and we are to take out the duties of parenthood in godly ways, in godly fashion. We are created in his image. Just as God is a triune being, we also are a body and mind and spirit. And so God's attributes are seen throughout the scriptures. We see his extreme love. When we think about fathers and how that they are called to be a loving person, uh, we see that this love is exhibited in very extreme ways. And then uh, an exceptional patience. God is a great, great patient God, and I'm glad that he is because he's also a God of judgment, and uh, I'm glad that uh, his patience, and I'm sure I have worn his patience then a time or two, but that's what love does. Love waits, doesn't it? And so we too are called upon to be patient in our, in our judgments. And then excruciating pain and sacrifice. God knows what pain is all about as he saw his son hanging upon a cross. Jesus literally suffered physically, physical pain as well as spiritual pain of separation uh, and sacrifice. God knows what it's like to give a child up. Uh, I tell parents that have to lose children that God knows how you feel. And then... Uh, Enormous care. Uh, God cares for us more than we care for ourselves, doesn't he? <laughs> and he has given us a rule book that we can go through life and we can uh, know what to do and what not to do that will make our journey uh, a lot smoother and we'll avoid a lot of potholes if we would read and heed his word. And so, fatherhood. Fathers are very unique, aren't they? Uh, they come in all sizes and uh, all types, all colors. Uh, they uh, come with a mindset that sometimes uh, wives don't understand, just like men don't understand wives. <laughs> and uh, I tell people, I, say, I don't understand my wife. I say, well, when you do, you write a book, it'll sell millions. <laughs> uh, but men are just that way also, aren't they? Men are doers and completers. Women are more emotional. And so they kind of merge together, don't they? Uh, but I remember uh, reading a story about this uh, father one day that he was uh, in the bedroom of their baby and he was sitting there looking at the crib and the baby was fast asleep. And the, the, the wife came up to him and put her arms around him and as he sat there, his eyes were watery. She could tell it was an emotional moment for him. And so she asked him, she said, a penny for your thoughts. And he looked at her and he said, you know, 
I just, I'll never understand how, by the, how anyone could make a crib like this for $49.95. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, a, that's the uniqueness that we see and many other things that we could all share, share that your fathers uh, are unique with their own personalities. Uh, but fathers are called to a high standard, aren't they? Man, I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a challenge. There is a, a, there's a, a new beginning when you look upon that child and you realize that you have a responsibility to that child, a greater responsibility than you have ever had uh, in your young life. And when you, when you look upon that child and you say, you know, I gotta do this right. And for many who have been doing things wrong, they, it, it does a, a, a metamorphosis to them as they become more loving and more uh, caring and with more patience. And sometimes the patience gets tested, doesn't it? Uh, but because of that love that God instills in a father, it's a, it's a, it's a new day. And so uh, someone said a child is not likely to find a father in God unless they find something of God in their father. I thought that was a good statement. A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in their father. Think about that. Uh, God models a picture of a great father in the prodigal son's father. If you remember that story found in Luke 15 and other verses of scripture, we remember that the prodigal son <clears throat> asked for his inheritance. Uh, he, he got it, the father gave it to him, and blessed him and he left and he went and the Bible says that he wasted his life in riotous living. Spent all of his inheritance having a good time in a far country and uh, for long he ended up in the pig pen desiring to be uh, fed with the food of the, the husks of the, that the hogs would eat and uh, I uh, I'm always amused by that because I like pig skins. <laughs> and that uh, doesn't mean I'm a prodigal, I just like them. And my family cannot understand why. But uh, nevertheless, we, uh, we, we know the story of how the Bible says that the prodigal son came to himself and that he got up finally out of the big pen and he came home. And uh, the father was waiting for him and when he when he saw him, the father took off and he ran. Someone uh, talks about, you know, how that's the, the, there's a song that we call God Ran. I believe Chris used to sing that song. And uh, it's a picture of God running to meet the sinner who is coming back home. And uh, there's no greater joy than to, uh, to read that story and know that God is that kind of a, of a God. And so I can imagine the scene we pictured here, uh, the emotion that was involved in the heart of that dad as the, as the son who had wandered away into the far country had uh, come back. And, and so many times I, I, I hear the prayer request of parents uh, for children who are, uh, who've been brought up in church and Sunday school, but they no longer have interest in those things. And they've gone out into the world and they've enjoyed the lure of sin in the world uh, that the world has to offer. And uh, we know the, the end product of sin. We've seen it. We've lived long enough to, to see that sin will take you where you don't want to go. It will uh, keep, there, keep you there longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And so when that prodigal comes home, uh, it's a great joy, not only in the heart of the father, but also in the mother. And so the love of a father that we think about is seen in that prodigal's father. And we know that that love is seen as a loving father. A loving father. And God is that because he has two things. For sure, a lot more, but he is, first of all, he is provisional. Uh, he provides our needs. We find that the prodigal father gave him his inheritance. And uh, he was, uh, 
willing to do that because he did not want his son to go away and to be destitute. And of course, we know that the son wasted it anyhow, but he still provided that. He could have said, no, your, your older son ought to get that first and uh, your brother should get that first. But he allowed the younger son to have his. And so we know that God provides. Philippians 4, 19, one of my favorite verses. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So God is the God of supply. He, he didn't uh, promise to give us our wants, but he did promise to give us our needs. And so we find God's example of providing those needs. And we as fathers are commanded to provide the needs of our family. In the book of 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5 and, and uh, verse uh, 8, uh, it tells us, but if any provide not for his own, and especially of those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And I think every father needs to understand that. And I've known some fathers that need to grow up, and they need to accept that responsibility. And they not depend upon the government, not to depend upon welfare. I know, remember one father who was bragging how much welfare they got, you know. Uh, it, wouldn't, wouldn't, it could have worked, but it didn't want to work. And uh, had all kinds of excuses for not working, but he... Uh, I uh, just bragged on, on that welfare. And I realize that I'm not against welfare because uh, uh, you pay for that, right? And uh, when you need it, you got to have it. And we thank the Lord for our country that provides that. Uh, but uh, not only is he provisional, but a loving father is uh, protective. Um, <clears throat> and so we don't uh, have to look very far to see the perfect protective hand of God. God gives us guardian angels. I, mine works overtime, I think, as I drive the highways and the byways and the metroplex. I'm sure sometimes they, I uh, go to the father and say, can I have a day off? <laughs> and I know some of you drive more than I do out there. And so you understand uh, what we're talking about. But nevertheless, uh, we know that, uh, you know, fathers protect their children. Uh, they were willing to give their lives in order that the lives of their children would be, uh, be, be spared uh, in a situation, any situation. Uh, and protect them from other people as well. Sometimes it's an advisement uh, to pick your friends wisely. Pick your friend. If there's any good information that you can give to your children, I believe that's right. one of the top priorities to teach your kids to pick your friends wisely. Pick friends that will take you up, not ones that will take you down. And that's a choice that we all have to make. And I've seen parents make bad choices for friends also, whether in the family or out of the family. Uh, there are some people in the family that you really don't want to be an influence on your children's lives. And so you have to make those tough choices to teach that. And then uh, from other people, uh, you've probably heard uh, a story or two about a, a young man that comes to pick up his girlfriend and meet the dad. And dad just, by chance, has to be, be cleaning his shotgun uh, when the young man uh, comes in, you know. And so uh, he wants that young man to know that he is responsible uh, to uh, treat his daughter uh, in a decent, upstanding way. Our, you know, like the daughter, uh, the guy was pestering this young lady to get, his, get her phone number. And she kept saying no. And he said, why? Won't you give me that phone number of yours? And uh, she said, well, I'll tell you what. She said, <laughs> she said, my father's phone number is the same as mine. Why don't you call him and uh, see about, ask about that? And so uh, our father is protective, as God is protective. <laughs> Psalm 28 and verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. And my heart is trusting in him. We trust in him because I am helped. And therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth with my song. Will I praise 
him. And so God is our strength. God is our shield. God is our rock. And I'm thankful to God today that in him I can flee and I can find protection from the storms of life. In him I can find a shade in a weary land. In him I can find a solace in times of heartache and sadness. He is always there for us because he is a loving father he is a provisional father and he is a protective father and then an authoritative power a loving father is an authoritative power colossians chapter 3 and verse 21 he tells us not to overuse our power and day by he says provoke not your children uh, to anger lest they be discouraged and doing <clears throat> discipline for children is a uh, is a great challenge for us sometimes new fathers want to uh, uh, demonstrate their authority and uh, god is the all authority but he has given us the place of leadership in our families doesn't he and so we are it's a divine triangle god at the top father and then the mother, and then the children come underneath that. And so they are to respect that whole, the, the whole holy trinity that God has set up and do it God's way. And so we have that authority to uh, raise our children, to raise them right, but we must not provoke our children uh, to, to anger. We have to not leash out our anger and discipline and anger but we need to let them know who is the boss uh, i remember uh, years and years ago before we had children our pastor's wife said to be a good parent you got to let your children know that you love them and who is the boss and children need to know that up front and then uh, we know that, that jesus said in matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 that uh, Jesus came uh, to his disciples and he said, all power, all, uh, that word is the word of Susia in the Greek language in which it was originally written. All power is given unto me. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he is the top authority. And so we have to seek God's uh, will, God's way uh, as we express our authority. Someone said authority is best followed by example, not by abusing. Not by abusing. Now we, in my day, we did corporal punishment. My kids will probably attest to that. I'll attest that my dad did. He believed in raising kids, probably about six inches off the ground. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I, I was never abused. God always used that padding that God put us back there for that. You know, but uh, I knew where the lines were. I always felt that if I didn't get caught, I'd go ahead and cut across the lines. But I found out the parents have a way of finding stuff out, you know. Even years later, they finally reveal it to you. But, um, but uh, uh, you know, don't assault your kids because they won't respect you. Not, not only physically, but mentally. You can damage children uh, and you can lose respect. Uh, uh, with them uh, if you abuse them mentally or physically. I'll just pass that on. I know none of you are guilty of that, but if you know somebody that is, tell them I said so, okay? And then, not only is it an authoritative power, but it's a forgiving power. A forgiving power. God is the great forgiver. Uh, and Isaiah uh, said a wonderful thing, but Aaron quoted this the other night. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I'm glad that God is a great, great forgiver, and if you're going to be a parent, you're going to have to <laughs> you're going to have to practice a lot of forgiving, aren't you? We have to expect that children are our children. They're not adults. And we realize as they grow up, they get a little bit more freedom. But 
uh, in the beginning, they have less, and as they grow older, and as they earn some privileges, sometimes you have to be able to be, hey, kids have to earn, earn that trust, and uh, but a lot of times they blow it just like we do, but we have to be willing to forgive them as much as God forgives us. And we're thankful that he is willing to do that. I remember uh, reading a story about Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison and his team had uh, been working on this contraption called a light bulb. <laughs> and it took them 24 hours to make one. And uh, after they had made this uh, particular light bulb, Thomas Edison gave that to a young boy and asked him to take it upstairs. I assume that they were in the basement. And so the young man carefully and nervously carried this precious light bulb up the stairs and he made it all the way to the very top and then he dropped it. And so that team had to start all over again. 24 hours it took them to make that new light bulb. And Thomas Edison, he took that light bulb and he gave it to that same young man who had dropped the first one to carry it upstairs. And you know what? That's forgiveness. <laughs> That's forgiveness. And that, with forgiveness comes trust. And so we find that God is a forgiving, forgiving father. And we as earthly fathers must forgive her. You know one thing about the prodigal's father that I always admired was the fact that that he didn't bring up the past. He did not bring up the past. He was not historical. And uh, he just said, let's, let's, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. And then he was an influential father. A loving father is an influential father that influences by his example and by his demeanor and by his actions. The prodigal son learned much from his father because he allowed him to, to discover himself. He probably knew that things might not go too well out there in the far country. But, you know, there comes a time where you have to cut them loose. You have to trust them to go out and to, yeah, make some mistakes. Just like we make those mistakes. If we can be honest, we'd say, yeah, I went out there and I sowed some oats that I shouldn't have sowed, but I learned from that. <clears throat> And, but my father was willing to forgive me and to give me a second chance. And we've all known earthly fathers that would not give a second chance. But we should be willing to give them that second chance because you mature and you learn from your mistakes more than you do from your successes. And the elder son, though, <laughs> he didn't value his identity, but his father had to teach him. He taught him about forgiveness as he forgave the, uh, the uh, younger son. Uh, uh, the, the older son, the elder son, he didn't get it. <laughs> Why are we going to forgive him? I've been with you all the time. I didn't go out to the far country. He went out to the far country. Why are we going to forgive him? He said, because he was lost, but he is now found. He was dead, but now he is alive. And so we rejoice that they are safe, even though they have erred, that they could have, it could have been a whole lot worse. And they could have come back in a box, and they didn't. And trust, we learned about trust, that a guy had to trust him to go out there, and yeah, he blew it. <laughs> Maybe like the father had blown it earlier in his life, and acceptance, to accept him back. Prodigal probably, you know, he probably worry about whether he would be accepted or not. But he came back and the father ran to him. And he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. And I said, put some shoes on this boy's feet. He said, but I'm a slave. He said, put a ring on his finger. Oh, but I'm not worthy. Put a robe on his back. Dad, I'm just willing to be a slave. The slaves were better off than I was down in the pig pen. Kill the fatty calf. We're going to party. And I see that prodigal son sitting at the table. 
sitting there with a robe on his back, ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, beef gravy <laughs> streaming down his chin. But he's home. And he's been accepted back into the family. An influential father. That's the kind of God that God is. He's a loving father. God made a balance in the family by expressing his nature reflected through both of the parents. The father is to be the leader. If we're not in that position of leadership, we need to get there. Challenge to be a leader and a loving father is a great one. It's great to fill that role as uh, thanks grace, thanks God's power that he's willing to give it to us. The world needs to see more loving, forgiving, accepting fathers. I read the story the other day. I read it years ago, and I ran across it again. I'm going to just take time to read it to you. Y'all just stay away. If somebody's sleeping next to you, just punch them and say, get close to being over. After a few of the, of the usual Sunday evening hymns, the church pastor walked once again, slowly stood up, walked over to the pulpit, gave a very brief introduction to his childhood friend. With that, an elderly man stepped to the pulpit to speak. <clears throat> he said, a father, his son, and a friend of his son were sailing off the Pacific coast, he began. When a fast approaching storm blocked any attempt to get back to shore, the waves were so high that even Though the father was an experienced sailor, he could not keep the boat upright, and the three were, or the two were swept, two boys were swept into the ocean. The old man hesitated for a moment, making eye contact with the two teenagers who were, for the first time since the service began, looking somewhat interested in this preacher's story. He continued. Grabbing a rescue line, the father had to make the most excruciating decision of his life. To which boy would he throw the other end of the line? He only had seconds to make the decision. The father knew that his son was a Christian. And he also knew that his son's friend was not. The agony of his decision could not be matched by the torrent of waves. As the father yelled out, I love you, son, he threw the line to his son's friend. By the time he pulled the friend back to the capsized boat, his son had disappeared beyond the range of his wells into the black of the night. His body was never recovered. By this time, the two teenagers were sitting straighter up in their pew, waiting for the next words to come out of the old man's mouth. The father, he continued, knew his son would step into eternity with Jesus. And he could not bear the thought of his son's friend stepping into eternity without Jesus. And therefore, he sacrificed his son said, how great is the love of God that he should do the same for us. With that, the old man turned and sat back down in his chair and silence filled the room. Within minutes after the service ended, the two teenagers were at the old man's side. That was a nice story, politely started one of the boys. But I don't think it was very realistic for a father to give up his son's life in hopes that the other boy would become a Christian. <clears throat> well, you got a point there, the old man replied, glancing down at his worn Bible. A big smile broadened his narrow face, and he once again looked up at the boys and he said, It sure isn't very realistic, is it? But I'm standing here today to tell you that, that that story gives me a glimpse of what it must have been like for God to give up his son for me. 
You see, I was the son's friend that was rescued. God is a God of love. The world needs to see love like that. And God loves you today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I would close by saying if you have never one-on-one -on -one personally asked Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord, your friend, that today you would do that. You can never know the loving God as your Father until you know Jesus, his Son, as your Savior. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I pray today that you would bless the message, the songs that have been sung. And I pray, Father, if there be even one in our congregation or in our viewing audience who has never opened their heart to Jesus to make him Savior and Lord and friend, and all that he is, is that today they would come to terms with that. And Lord, if they don't really understand it all, that they would seek someone out, a parent, a grandparent, a preacher, a teacher, someone that they respect, that would tell them how simple it is to let Jesus come into their hearts and know that they know that they know that they're heaven-born and heaven-bound. And we pray this all in the sweet name of Jesus. And thank you for your heavenly love. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. A son really tells the father.
Seated. We're going off the air. I got a few things I want to say. 